Poor old Peter. He often got things wrong, didn't he? He he cut off the ear of a guard who was arresting Jesus, do you remember? And then got soundly told off for it. He failed to keep his eyes on Jesus when he was walking on the water and he sank and had to be rescued by Jesus. He denied Jesus three times before the cock crowed and then had to make amends three times for his forget his sin of denying Jesus. And then in today's gospel reading, Jesus compares him to Satan. <laughs> Get behind me, Satan. Because he refused to accept what Jesus was saying about the necessity of his forthcoming death. Poor old Peter. He just got it wrong all the time. And yet this same failing, apparently rather incompetent man from time to time, is the rock on whom Jesus says he will build his church. This same failing, apparently incompetent man is the one to whom Jesus will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, as incidentally is depicted in the stained glass image of Peter to the right of our high altar. You might want to come up and take a look at it after the service. Peter gives me hope. Because... Whilst I know that you all think that I am totally infallible and incapable of error, stop laughing and sniggering, Maddie. I know different. I know that inside the charade of competence that I show to the world, I'm actually a bit of a mess. Much of the extended time that I had off last year was as a result of me not being quite so well put together as I had thought. You see, I think Jesus called Simon Peter the rock as a bit of a joke. I think it would have been a bit like him calling him Rocky, to translate it into to modern parlance. Rocky as in <laughs> a bit wobbly. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit rocky there. <laughs> the evidence of the Gospels is that Peter was anything but the steady, dependable type of person uh, to the, the title rock would suggest. He was flaky. He changed his mind a lot. He got the wrong end of the stick frequently. (laughs) I think, I I can even imagine that when Jesus called Peter Rocky (laughs) for the first time, he probably had a big grin on his face. You can imagine, you know, Jesus just grinning. It it would be like if Jesus gave me a nickname and and called me Skinny, for example, yeah? Hmm. This understanding of Peter should serve to give all of us hope. Let's notice that Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. The growth of the church, thank God, does not rely on me. It doesn't rely on you. Even though many of you are brilliant at playing your part in building the kingdom in lots of different ways, The growth of the church and the work of the kingdom is Jesus' sacred task. It's Jesus who will build his church. Not me, not you, not even the amazing Sandra. It's Jesus who will build his church. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the architect and the master builder of the church. And that, incidentally, is the lesson of our Hebrew Bible reading of today from the book of Numbers. We saw Moses doing miraculous signs, didn't we, by striking a rock with his staff and causing water to gush forth. Now, of course, it wasn't Moses who performed this miracle. It was God acting through Moses. Moses had no power of his own, only that which God gave him. God was acting through Moses despite the fact that Moses himself was anything but perfect when you look at his story. He, for example, had murdered an Egyptian soldier when he found that soldier beating a slave and he got really angry at the man and what he was doing and so he murdered him. He took the law into his own hands. 
Later, he lost trust in God's ability to deliver the Israelites from the desert. And for that failure, God said, and we heard it in our reading just now, that that it would not be Moses who would lead the people into the promised land. Quite a punishment after a lifetime of, of speaking for God and leading the people. But surely God's point is that it was, it was God who was leading the people. It was God who was building a nation, not Moses. These were to be the people of God, not the people of Moses. And yet God used Moses, another rocky individual, to bring about his purposes. So what does this mean for us? in practical terms. Well, it means perhaps uh, returning to that modern cliché which has lost some of its currency and power in recent years through overuse and parody, but which I think still has value. I'm talking about the old saying, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? It was expressed on the wristbands and necklaces of thousands of young Christians in the 1980s and 90s, wasn't it? Perhaps you even wore one at some point in those days. My daughter used to wear a T-shirt with the phrase, Who would Jesus bomb across her chest? Which is quite a thought-provoking question, isn't it? But what would Jesus do is the heart of the question. And it's actually a pretty easy question to ask in every situation, isn't it? It's still an important question to ask in any effort that we make to build God's kingdom here on earth. If any church, and especially our little corner of the church, is to be built by Jesus, as he promises, then it's going to have to be built on the principles that Jesus lived and taught, isn't it? When, for example, we consider the benefits of the latest money-making wheeze for the parish, let's ask, what would Jesus do? That's something that the PCC did a few years ago when we were invited to join the postcode lottery that Haven't Borough Council were setting up. We understand why they did it. It sounds very uh, a very good idea for raising money for local good causes, but our PCC said, no, not so sure about that. What would Jesus do? And they felt that at the time fundraising via a professional gambling syndicate is not something that Jesus would do. When we're thinking about how to allocate our tiny resources of time and of money, what do we ask? What would Jesus do? How much time do we spend on administration versus how much time do we spend directly engaging with people, uh, our neighbours who are in need? That question helps us to find some balance. How much of the money that God has blessed us with individually do we spend on ourselves, on our comfort, on our recreation? And how much do we give for the task of building God's kingdom here in Haven't? Because while it is God who unquestionably does the building, for Jesus says, I will build my church... He does so only in cooperation with rocky individuals like you and me. It's a good maxim to apply to our personal lives too. What would Jesus do? Someone has upset me. They have insulted me. Should I rage or should I forgive? What would Jesus do? Someone has left me a lot of money in their will. Oh, joy, happiness. Should I hoard it, go on very expensive holidays, buy myself a jet plane? Or should I use it generously for the building of the kingdom of heaven? What would Jesus do? I think you get the point. The rock on which Jesus builds his church is not one man from 2,000 years ago. It's every person 
who serves Jesus as Lord and follows his ways, even though we get it wrong quite a lot of the time. Jesus said he could build his church on a pretty messed up guy called Simon Peter, but Peter and Moses before him stand for us. Jesus can build his church on anyone who is willing to let God use them and lead them. However much we fail in the sacred task of building the church of God. Can I get an amen? Amen.